right, that's enough jibber jabber out there. So uh, we'll go on to the next slide, uh, please, and uh, we'll jump right into what we're talking about today. Continue on with this uh, Giving Christmas thing, and today's topic has to do with pregnancy. So we're going to uh, examine that uh, just a little bit uh, here in a moment. Uh, the whole gist of this series has been that if we approach Christmas differently, uh, in terms of giving Christmas, Christmas literally means Christ Mass. Mass means celebration. So if we celebrate um, Christ in a giving kind of way, if we basically, if we give, give Christ, the Spirit of Christ away, uh, that we will experience Christmas in an entirely different way. In fact, if we do it right, by December 26, we're not exhausted, but we're exhilarated uh, because Christmas gives back. Uh, when we choose to give Christmas uh, to other people. And today we're going to examine that in a kind of a whole different way. Uh, first, a note about Crosswalk. Dar mentioned it, but our goal here as a church is simply to help connect you in relationship with God that not only impacts your life, but impacts the world in which we live, both real close to home and your sphere, uh, our community, but even as you heard today, all the way out in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, in their slums. So that's kind of our goal today, and hopefully this series has helped you uh, connect those dots. And I've said this the uh, past few weeks, if you love Crosswalk, uh, most of you are here because you're fans of Crosswalk. If you love Crosswalk, love us in the offering plate because <laughs> that's how we make things happen around here. We need your support. We appreciate your support. We've had a great year here at Crosswalk, and we look forward to seeing the great things happen in uh, 2016. So let's just jump right into the text on the next slide, and uh, I'll stop a little bit uh, to explain some things. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, this is John the Baptist's mother, uh, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. Now just uh, to back up the truck a moment, remember that Elizabeth is an old woman at this point. Uh, she's into retirement years in our vernacular. Her and her husband uh, were both in retirement years and both uh, deeply revered for their character, their spirituality, uh, the whole thing. What was really odd about this is that they were pregnant because when you're 80 years old or whatever, that's generally not the time you're thinking about having kids. <laughs> and that's kind of where they were at that time. So, um, so Mary gets this visit from, uh, from this angel in just a moment. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. Mary was a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Now let's stop there for just a second. Why would Mary be confused and disturbed after, angel, after the angel Gabriel says this to her? Well, first of all, it's an angel talking to her. So I think we'd all be a little confused and disturbed at that point. But also what the angel had to say uh, was confusing and disturbing all at the same time. Uh, confusing because the angel said, Greetings, favored woman. If you lived in the first century and you were a woman, you never heard the word favored attached to that. Uh, you were treated like property. Uh, there were more rights for animals and land than there were for you legally. Uh, it wasn't a glamorous time to be a woman. We've made a lot of ground on that and still have a long ways to go. Uh, but Mary would be confused that she would be receiving a visit from one of God's messengers because that just didn't happen. That was a rare, rare, rare occurrence and God hadn't even been heard audibly for hundreds of years until this season uh, in history and now all of a sudden she's getting this visit. But then the angel also said, the Lord is with you. And again, that's not something you would expect an angel to tell you if you were a young woman. It just didn't add up. So she's got all kinds of emotions going on in her. And remember, she's like 13, 14 years old. So she's young. She's got a long way to grow. And her mental, emotional development, this is a whole lot to take in. So let's go see what happens in the next slide. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, How can this happen? I'm a virgin. And on the next screen, he answers the question. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. 
What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. Now, I need to say a few words here about what's happening in the text. Uh, For hundreds of years at least, and maybe even longer than that, uh, there's been a lot of dialogue on the historicity of this event. Historicity is actually a word. Look it up. But historicity simply means, is what we're reading in the text factually accurate? Did a 13, 14-year-old virgin really get impregnated somehow in some mystical way by the Holy Spirit? Is that really what we take home? And we enter into the equation, into this dialogue, uh, with an interesting slant. You may not realize this, but the whole idea of the importance of virgin birth in terms of um, setting the stage for a perfect Jesus to grow into maturity and then be slaughtered as the Lamb of God, that whole idea didn't exist in the church for several hundred years. The whole doctrine of that whole enchilada didn't even make the theological conversation for hundreds of years. Which is why when people look at this story, there's still conversation going on. And if you're on that fence a little bit, you're like, man, do I have to, do I have to sign off on the historicity of this event in order to buy in to the whole Jesus and faith thing? Uh, Is there any room for mystery there, gray area? Am I allowed to even be here if I'm not quite sure about how I feel about that? The answer is a resounding yes. You're welcome to be here because this dialogue's been going on a long time. In fact, uh, a book that we're going to do a series around sort of in a few months um, called The Meaning of Jesus was written by two uh, authors, two uh, historians from opposite perspectives. And one of the authors of this book, his name is N.T. Wright, which is probably the most revered scholar in evangelical um, times right now. He is the most uh, prolific writer within the evangelical, which is a conservative branch of Christianity. And they talk about this very thing. Um, Is this thing real? Did this really happen the way the Bible said it happened? And they go back and forth with the arguments and the, does this matter, does that matter, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the chapter, N.T. Wright, the most noted and quoted uh, scholar of our day from the evangelical camp says, if it didn't happen, it doesn't change my belief in Christ. I'm still going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. So, if the greatest scholar of our day in that conservative camp says, uh, I can be okay with some gray area on this, we can be okay with some gray area on this. But what I don't want you to miss is the other things that we can definitely look at and have uh, some confidence in. Like, first of all, remember, we're talking about a, a story that was finally put onto to paper or, or whatever um, a few decades after Jesus was born. So we're somewhere in the mid-60s when Luke wrote this. Luke's a medical doctor. He wants to get the story right. He's uh, asking the community of believers, uh, uh, both uh, who had firsthand information and those who were second generation, tell me about what happened. And he knows the story of uh, John and Elizabeth and Zechariah. And just from a literary perspective, understand what Luke is trying to do here. He's given us a whopper story about the birth of John the Baptist. Zachariah and Elizabeth in their old age get pregnant? That's crazy. Only God could do that. But here's the thing. John is second fiddle to Jesus. And Luke wants to make that clear. So when you're crafting the story and your spotlight is not going to stay on John the Baptist, the community of believers started uh, to, to talk about this and just appreciate it from a literary perspective, nothing else. Luke is saying, well, goodness gracious, what is, what makes a better story than an old woman getting pregnant? How about a very young one that doesn't get pregnant in the usual way? And so from a literary theological standpoint, Luke is giving us a spotlight on the one to come already at the very beginning in the first chapter of his message to anybody who's going to read it. You thought John the Baptist was something. Well, I'm telling you, right from the very beginning, this Jesus was even more incredible. 
So just hold on to that for a while. And I'm not going to dig into the if, thans, and what's of uh, the historicity of it this morning. All I meant to say was, you have some room for some mystery there, and that's okay. But don't miss, don't miss what they certainly talked about in the first century as they're around their campfires and dinner table, wondering about the mystery of how this whole thing came about. So I want to play with you on that. We're talking about Mary, a 13, 14-year-old girl who's just starting to enter into womanhood, and now she has this experience of, of being pregnant. Not popular, <laughs> uh, not supported likely by her community, uh, not believed. Who would believe such a thing? But let's just talk about pregnancy for a moment. So you moms in the audience, I want you to just kind of talk out loud to me a little bit about pregnancy. Uh, I didn't find it that compelling, really. I mean, when uh, Lynn and I had our kids, I didn't notice a whole lot of changes in myself at all, and I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering if you did. So first, let's just talk about physical things. Um, when you were pregnant, did anything change for you physically? <laughs> talk to me a little bit. What was your experience like? So you gained some weight, right? And you got a good excuse for it, right? <laughs> hey, come to think of it, I gained some weight when my kids were <laughs> in the womb too. Uh, exhaustion, I think I heard that phrase, right? Yep, I remember Len, uh, her back was aching, didn't have as much energy. My father-in-law, who uh, they'll come into town this week, um, he made a mistake. He came to visit when Len was just three months pregnant, you know, when, when the baby is like a rice grain, you know, kind of a thing. And Len was really tired. And he made the mistake of saying, I don't understand why you're so tired when the baby's only this big. <laughs> you generally don't say things like that to, uh, to anybody, but especially pregnant women. Okay, so uh, weariness, tired, exhaustion, right? What else? Hormones, right? They're off the charts. It's going to mess with you. What else? Worry, okay. What else? Nausea, right. We have a gal that's uh, part of our church. I uh, was in the early service. She just let me know. She's three and a half months pregnant, and they haven't been here a lot. And I was like, oh, I wonder if they got work stuff. Nope, she's just been really sick uh, in the morning, right? Uh, Danny Newman uh, chimed in, was sick for six months uh, with that thing. So that was not good news for the woman that's uh, three and a half months pregnant, by the way. Okay, cravings, right? Uh, anybody have any weird cravings when you're pregnant? Give me one. Vodka? Did somebody say vodka? <laughs> no way. That can't be right. <laughs> What's that? Hot dogs. That makes a lot more sense than vodka. Okay. Take you off my prayer list, Joan. Good. All right. Yeah, my wife was, uh, she craved cheeseburgers, I think, when Noah was uh, in her room. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody else have weird cravings? Olives and donuts. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Yeah, right. Cantaloupe with peanut butter. Oh, that sounds kind of good, actually. Potato chips for you? Ice cream and potato chips. Wow, that sounds pretty good. All right, so a lot of physical changes uh, happen for sure. Actually, your whole body is rocked, right, with physical changes. Um, how about mental changes? The way you think. Not the way you feel yet, but the way you think. Did the way you think change much when you were pregnant? Okay, I hear a lot of absolutely. What changes when you're in that sphere of life? Yeah, Sherry. It was wonderful, okay, so all positive, that's good. Scary, okay, intellectually scary, right, mentally challenging. Anything else? Priorities, right, you start to think things through differently about uh, what you're doing with your life and your body, where you go, what you're taking into your body, all that kind of stuff. You think differently, okay? Uh, how many of you, long before you were pregnant, uh, like years before you were pregnant, how many of you picked up the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting? Nobody reads that book until they're pregnant, right? I don't think you understood my question. <laughs> you're kind of weird, you know, if you're like eight or something, and you're reading what, you make a lot of people nervous if you do that. But all of a sudden, you're on a learning curve, right? You get all these reading pamphlets, things from the doctors. They want to equip your brain with understanding what's going to happen. You learn all about your own body, what's taking place in there. 
Uh, even guys get on uh, track with this. So you go home to what is your, your safe place, your sanctuary. And up until that point, pre-pregnancy, you looked at your place as a wonderful place to rest and relax. But now with one on the way, you see every danger sign. You recognize you're living in a horror show, you know, right there. And you realize you've got a task list this long that you never even thought about because you've got to make all these changes in your house to make it safe uh, for the new one to come. You learn about all kinds of stuff that you never wanted to know about. Strollers, cribs, burping stuff, diapers, all kinds of stuff. This is all mentally a stretch. Okay, how about emotionally? Do, do women go through any emotional changes at all during pregnancy? <laughs> there is a stupid question, right? Uh, okay, so crying, yep. Uh, not sure why, but sometimes you're just crying. Yep, okay, anything else? Anger? Why did you do this to me, husband? <laughs> right? I think I got that a couple of times. Um, yeah, you know what? I think the emotional bandwidth just kind of expands at that point. Uh, you're more vulnerable. There's all kinds of hormonal things going on, and you're much more... It's like the motions are more pronounced at that time than they would be at other times. And once the baby is born, one of the amazing experiences of that uh, is even though... Um, even though you go through enormous pain <laughs> to get that baby out, as soon as the baby's out, there is this experience of love that you really can't quite explain, right? This slimy, gooey mess of a person <laughs> you immediately love. It's fascinating. So that's an emotional stretch uh, that happens with this whole pregnancy kind of event. Happiness, yeah, right. Uh, how about um, how about spiritually? Did any of you grow in your spirit, your awareness of God, uh, your relationship with God uh, in that pregnancy time? Did it was it a catalyst in any way? Anybody? A few of you? Okay, we'll just take that as a yes. Uh, for us, you know, it was kind of a miraculous time. It was a miraculous experience. Your co-creators here. Uh, and it's extraordinary. And so when you're in that moment, uh, you kind of are tied in in a new way uh, with our own Creator. And you're just, you're, you have a capacity for awe uh, that, that you didn't know you had before. It just takes you in another place. It's very interesting stuff. Well, I wanted to share this stuff with you because that's the kind of stuff that Mary went through. That was her life experience, except that probably nobody believed her story. Parents weren't real excited about what was going on. And by the way, just a little side note. I think the church uh, does a terrible job with the Marys of our world today uh, because people um, get pregnant when they didn't expect to get pregnant. And the church doesn't know what to do with that. And too often the church shames the, the woman uh, for getting herself into this kind of trouble. And this is a time when girls need great support. <laughs> not our condemnation. So if you've ever been on the receiving end of that from a church or Christians, just want to apologize on behalf of that because it's just the wrong approach. Um, anyway, uh, that's a little off base. But I think about Mary and I think that kind of experience and scorn she deserved. And I thought, man, you know, if you could go back and just whisper in the ear of some of those people in the village and say, man, you got to get off your high horse here. This girl needs your support and your help. So why don't you get over yourself and get over your judgment and start being supportive? Wouldn't you love to just go back and talk about how the world changed because this is happening? I mean, you'd love to be able to do that. So, um, so anyway, I wanted to do that because uh, I want to talk about this idea of pregnancy as it relates to Christmas in us. And to help you kind of visualize this a little bit, I was recently at the Legion of Honor um, this past week. I took a group of pastors there. Uh, for an exhibit that was there. And I noticed in the top part of the Legion of Honor, they had a, a really extraordinary gallery. And it was entirely filled uh, with nativity uh, scenes, Mary and the baby. And so go ahead and start it off. Uh, every so often you're going to see these uh, images change. There's one that I want you to look for. Um, it kind of looks like a laser beam's coming down on Mary. That's how somebody portrayed uh, the Annunciation, you know, when this whole birth thing, uh, conception thing started. So that one's kind of cool. Um, you know, a lot of people in antiquity, when they, uh, when they commissioned a painting, they wanted their look to be evident on the faces of Mary or the other characters. So you're going to see uh, 
that one picture. You know, they say that there's no ugly baby. Well, you're going to see one. <laughs> so, so look for that. And who, know, who, who knows who paid for that, you know, baby to become Jesus. But anyway, it kind of shows up. And uh, just enjoy the, 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 uh, the photo gallery here I took illegally. And uh, go see them for yourself because uh, they're, they're really cool. So uh, the reason I want to talk about this is I think there's some dots that we need to connect uh, about our faith. When we think about Mary and the pregnancy uh, that she had with Jesus, I think there are great similarities, actually. Uh, when we think about what happened with Mary as she literally looked after uh, the cultivation of the Christ child within her and our own faith development. I think too often when we think about things of faith, uh, we relegate those to simply purely spiritual matters, especially here in the West, because spirituality for many of us is a luxury item in our life. If we can fit church in, if we can fit spirituality in, that's a wonderful addition to our life. But what if the whole faith thing is supposed to be central? What if it's supposed to be core? And what if we started to treat our faith with the same kind of diligence and expectations that you would if you were a woman expecting a child? Think about what that would do to you. Think about how we would think differently. If we immediately started to think, okay, I'm pregnant with Christ. And by the way, I think the, the Spirit of God, I think the, the, the spark of God, if you will, I think is with us all, even if you don't know it. I think that is an eternal thing. Uh, that is there. Whether or not you cultivate it, that's what we're talking about today. But I think it's there for you. And so if you know you're pregnant, good news everybody, you're pregnant. If you know you're pregnant uh, and this thing is within you, then you should know that there are going to be some changes that come along. And one of those changes, if this thing is healthy, if it continues to grow, if we allow it to grow, is we know there are going to be some physical changes in our life, right? So what might those be? especially for a guy who I can't imagine the physical changes you go through if you're pregnant. Well, I started to think about that a little bit and realize that many physical changes have taken place in my life as I have allowed the Christ child to mature in me. First and foremost, uh, an easy one is my time. All of a sudden, my, the way I think about my time is very different. Whereas before, if I don't really give a rip about the Christ child in me trying to come to fruition, trying to grow, before that, the world is pretty much about me, myself, and I. And it's about what I want to do all of the time. But now that I know I'm cultivating, that there's something within me that wants to grow, it changes my calendar. I spend time doing things that I might not otherwise do. Time spent trying to understand who this is that is wanting to grow within me, this God. Who is God? Who is Jesus? that I might get on board with that. It changes where I spend my time in service, too. All of a sudden, I give time to things that I might not otherwise give time to. Another physical change, like a tangible physical thing, is money. If I didn't have Christ growing in me, or if I squash Christ, <laughs> if I just let the Spirit of God within me just be as small as possible, the way I spent my money would not be touched at all. But because Christ has grown in me, uh, I want to be generous toward the things that I know matter to God. And so because of that, because I understand that part of allowing this thing to mature and blossom in me and make me who I'm supposed to become, more like the expression of Jesus, that means that I set aside money in my budget to support the work of Crosswalk, to support our food pantry and the missions that we support, to give to Faraha, to make sure that they get the food that they need to eat. That's a physical reality that if this thing is growing within us, it will affect our bottom line or how we treat our budget. You ever think about that? It affects what I do with my body. It affects uh, how I eat, how I drink, whether or not I exercise, whether or not I treat this body as a temple of the Holy Spirit or something I can just throw away. The ramifications just on the physicalness of whether or not I'm fostering the growth of Christ within me are pretty significant mentally. Just as as soon as you're pregnant, you start reading things uh, that you never wanted to read before. Well, for me, uh, when I think about maturing my, the Christ within me, it causes me to read more because I wonder, uh, how can I get to know this greater other that is wanting to grow in me better? How can I wrap my brain around that? And there have been many paradigm shifts over my life. Uh, experts say you'll have 
maybe three, four. There's the ugly baby. I knew it. As soon as I heard the ooh. <laughs> I know. This looks like it should be in, I don't know, the uh, Lord of the Rings or something. You know, something creepy coming out of the dirt, but uh, there it is. Anyway, no offense, whoever you are, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I digress. So we, we grow mentally in our understanding. Experts say we have two, three, four major paradigm shifts in our life. I mean, major rock your world, completely upside down kind of transformational experiences. Well, I've experienced some of those uh, just through life and also because God has stretched my thinking. And when that happens, uh, it's, it's learning curve time. If you're brand new on this whole Jesus stuff and you're wondering how it all works out, you're going to have a learning curve and you should expect that. Uh, because that's just the way it is. There's a lot that you don't know. And if you find out more about what you can know, it allows Christ to grow within you a lot more. And of course, emotionally. As these transformations have taken place, at least in my life, I've noticed that uh, with every one, which often they're wrapped around pain or struggle or something like that, my emotional bandwidth increases. Now, my bachelor's was in psychology, so I'm not unaware of our emotional side of life, and I respect it. Uh, but I don't know what it is, but I think when we choose to, to trust God through the shift and go through the tough stuff together, I think our heart enlarges in a good way. I think we're able to feel and experience in a deeper way. So whereas 20 years ago, I might see something or read something and it would have no consequence on me emotionally. Now, when I could read that very same thing, all of a sudden I feel myself tearing up. Or I feel a sense of joy at a story that maybe I couldn't before. Or I grieve some things that I didn't have the capacity to grieve for before. Or I'm passionate about things that I know God is passionate about where I wasn't so passionate about them before. Particularly as I grow older, I'm deeply concerned about the people in the world that are overlooked, that are treated with great injustice, and what can we do to help them and serve them, because that's a very Jesus thing to do. So emotionally that's happened. Of course, spiritually, the more we develop that side of us, the, the greater our eyes are focused in on being able to see the presence of God all around us. Things change when we start to think of our faith relationship as being pregnant. Our expectations change when we realize that it's going to impact everything about us, every sector of our being. And I'm wondering, have you paid attention to that? You know, as a pastor, I'm sort of, sort of like a spiritual obstetrician, right? That's kind of my job, is if you come talk to me about how your life's going and, and what's not going, and sometimes, you, usually I get people when they're in crisis, that's kind of my job is to ask questions to understand the health of your relationship and find out how well the Christ child is progressing in your life. And what I've discovered is in my own life and, and many others, uh, and probably yours too, there are times in our life when we kind of wish we weren't pregnant. And we wish we could just keep the whole Christ thing, you know, the size of a grain of rice because we don't want to be bothered with it. We don't really want the physical changes. Who asks for this anyway? We don't, we're too tired to have the learning curve. Just let me, let me keep my infantile belief. I don't, I don't want to stretch in my thinking. What's the point of that? Emotionally, I don't, I don't want to feel anymore. <laughs> or I don't want to go deeper. I don't want to be passionate about something other than myself. And spiritually, we're just fine keeping God relegated to something we do for an hour and a half or so on Sunday mornings. Don't trouble me with making it a whole life thing. I think we do that in our work with Christ within. And what I want to tell you up to this point is, as your spiritual obstetrician, <laughs> I'm concerned about it. And the good news is, is you, I'm helpful in this regard, but you know, the reality is, um, just like a, a physical obstetrician, a, a doctor who's looking after a woman uh, who is in the process of going to 40 weeks, they're taking measurements all over the place. And the doctors know that if certain things aren't happening uh, in the woman's experience, they could be trouble signs that they need to look into. Some obvious things, like, like if you've uh, had a baby and we've gone through a couple miscarriages, and I know the pain of that, um, if, if you're at a certain level, and all of a sudden, 
the feelings of being pregnant are gone. That could be a warning sign. And the obstetrician knows we need to pay attention to this. Or if you don't feel the kick anymore, you don't feel any movement, that could be a horrible sign that something's not right. If all of a sudden emotionally the hormone thing is, is gone, that could be a bad sign. And the obstetrician knows to take a look at those signs to say there's a problem here that we need to address. The problems in our life, the things that we go through, are opportunities for us to look and see where can Christ grow in this. So just in your own life, you got a mess in a relationship with somebody that you sure wish that mess wasn't there. Guess what? That's your invitation to go a little bit deeper because remember, the word salvation, this thing that Jesus came to, to give, literally means to be healed. It means to be restored. So where in our life there is a lack of health, where in our life there is a lack of feeling healed, where there is an area that we know needs to be restored, we just got a gift, a gift from God to say, you need to take a look at this because the signs are indicating that the Christ child is not developing well in you. And maybe there's some healing that can happen in your life that I think wants to happen. Now, all this that I've said to you so far is just introductory comments. Don't look at your watch. <laughs> the good news is, is the second thing I want to say is all built on the first thing and won't take that long. And that's simply this. What we do with this Christ growing within us, it's not really about just having Christ grow within us. It's really not the final goal. What do you do with a woman uh, who doesn't put her phone on silence in a... <laughs> just kidding. What do, you, <laughs> what do you do with a woman uh, who gets to 40 weeks? Uh, I don't know if this has ever happened in the history of the world, but gets to 40 weeks and says, you know... I just love how I feel right now. Let's go another 20 weeks and just see what happens, right? Well, the doctor first is going to say to her, I have some people you need to talk to right after our visit, but the doctor is going to flat out say, that can't happen. Why can't that happen? Tell me. The time has come. What, what happens if somehow she holds the baby in for another 20 weeks. What happens? The baby dies and who else dies? She dies. Because we're not made to just keep it within ourselves. It's made to come out. And it's not easy. It's painful. But it's a beautiful thing when it does. It's made to be out there, not just in here. Giving Christmas is about out here, not just in here. I had a great conversation this week in one of our Bible studies, and a gal said from last week's teaching, said, man, you've been making me do spiritual gymnastics all week. Love that. Love that. And messing with her a lot. And so we were talking about the dynamics of, of last week, and what does it mean that the angel says, I bring good news that will bring great joy to all people, not just some people, but all people. And so we talked a lot about that. And one of the things that uh, came out was this. God really doesn't give a rip. If you feel spiritually peaceful and you do nothing for anybody else in your world, you've flat out missed the point. You've gone to full term and you've kept the baby inside yourself. If your spirituality is just about your inner peace, you've missed it. The baby wants to come out. And the way the baby comes out is when we begin to serve, love, touch, come alongside others. You, you get this cool opportunity where I'm not the only one that is a spiritual obstetrician. You are. You who are walking with Jesus. You who are learning about the ways of God. You become spiritual, faithful obstetricians in your world around you. This is what I mean. Because I believe that God is at work in every single person and loves every single person in the whole world, no matter what their skin tone, their orientation, everything, that God loves us all equally. And I believe that God is trying to restore, heal, save the whole enchilada, help us become everything that we are to become uh, with every single person. 
The difference is they might not know that. But if that's what we really believe, then you get to be an agent of healing, restoration, health for that person. So when you see somebody who's struggling with some kind of physical thing, be it um, they're stressed out to the max because they don't know how to do their time right or, or they're in a terrible uh, mess at work or whatever, the, or they're sick or whatever, now you get to come alongside and you become, you become the incarnation. The Spirit of God is with you to help them. And when you give yourself this way, when you guide them along, and you don't have to use churchy language, you don't have to be churchy at all, you, you don't even have to use faith language at all. When you simply come as the embodiment of the presence of God for that person in that moment, you're helping Christ develop in that person. You're helping restoration, healing, saving happen. And it's a great privilege. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. But the giving Christmas thing is about giving to other people. The reason why Christmas gives back when you give Christmas away is because how can it not? Instead of thinking about your whole world and your own personal spiritual development, you're wondering, is this any good or not? When you break free of that severe limitation and you start to realize that the next step of Christ growing in your life is out here, you walking among your community, you helping people with their physical needs, as obvious as the kids in Faraha or as obvious as the hungry people in Napa, or you realize that there are some mental shifts that somebody just hasn't thought about it in a different way, and you get to be, you, it's like you sense the whisper of God in your life saying, well, you ought to just tell them that because that's probably going to be really helpful. And you actually see them get helped, or you help, you help soothe an emotional, painful place for them just because you come alongside and you listen, or you help them think through and experience God in a powerful way that they couldn't even see God at the end of their nose, and God's all over the place in their life. Man, that's a give back. You get the holy privilege, privilege of seeing God at work in your midst. That's where the game's at. Maybe it's time for you to have the baby. Maybe it's time for you to go that next level and realize it never was about just you. But it becomes the great gift when we choose to get it out of ourselves and actually do something with it. When we care about the world around us. So I don't know what you're hearing today. I don't know if the thing that you're going to take home today is just this idea that Christianity and faith is not just a, a personal spiritual journey, but that it's going to affect your physicality, your mentality, your emotional life, as well as your spiritual life. Maybe that's the big nugget that you're supposed to take home today. Get God out of this tiny little box we call faith and let God permeate absolutely everything that you are toward your greater wholeness and health. That is an expression of salvation. Maybe that's it. Maybe today the nuggets that you got was that you recognize that you've got a problem area in your life. There's, a, there's an indicator in your life that says there's a growth that needs to happen here. This is suggesting that death is taking place and we need to remedy that. So maybe that's your nugget as you realize there's something for you to go after. And it often is evidenced in painful places in our life. Or maybe today is the day where you, you realize that the missing ingredient in a vital faith for you is because you've been so, uh, so exhaustively uh, invested in a personal spirituality of seeking and holding on to inner peace that you didn't realize that the baby is at 40 weeks. And your next step of allowing your faith to explode is by getting out there and giving Christmas, of allowing this Christ to be out there, you taking it out there. And what a wonderful world it would be if we did. Christmas gives back when we give the celebration of Christ in our relationships, in our family. So, a few days away, Christmas. A lot of us are going to be with family members uh, that we don't spend a whole lot of time with. Maybe you don't want to spend a whole lot of time with them. That's often the case. I get all kinds of emails from therapists right now, you know, giving, like I'm on their email list and stuff, and they're saying how to handle the stressors <laughs> of family coming back home because that's a reality. Well, if you're to give Christmas, 
If you now look at yourself not as a victim of some weird systems all blending together over the holiday times, what if you change your mind? What if you change your lens? And now it's not about that. It's about how do I bring Christmas to this? How do I get to be the incarnation of God in this moment? How do I get to take the Spirit of God into this dynamic? What's it going to do to your patience level? What's it going to do to your compassion level? What's it going to do to everything? You become an agent of healing and health and joy and peace instead of feeling like a victim. You're not only, you're not only allowed to do this, you're called to do this. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. This is what he's talking about. You go, you go be the presence of Jesus where you are, that they would get a clue that this Jesus leads us to a relationship with God that restores every, every fiber of our being. So you get to do that. The Apostle Paul talks about when we get a little bit uppity on ourselves about our giftedness, when we're really inward thinking, he says, you know what, you can be a rock star Christian and know all the verses and be able to quote theology and have great arguments out there because you've worked on it so internally. But let me tell you something, if you haven't figured out how to love people, if it's not getting out of you in love, you have totally missed the point. And you're an infant. It's time to let Christ grow. Not just in here anymore but out here, wherever you go. So we're going to pray together, let you do your business that you need to with God. And then I got a final video uh, just to kind of remind you of the joy that we have uh, when we give outside of ourselves generously. Uh, some stuff from Faraha that you're going to see, some images uh, of them eating food that you provided, which is incredible. You're giving them life and hope uh, just because you choose to be generous. So let's pray together, and then you can enjoy the video. So God, I don't know how you're messing with us, but I hope that you won't let this idea of being pregnant with the very essence of Christ, I pray that you won't let that go on us. Some of us don't want to hear it. We won't hear it. We've got a lot of baggage when it comes to religion and faith. But help us not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because history and sometimes we have made a mess of it doesn't mean that you're not there. doesn't mean that you're not good. You are there. You are good. Help us cultivate what you have in us. Help us be honest with ourselves about the problem areas uh, that we would do our, our due diligence uh, to look after health that you are guiding us toward. And remind us, God, that this baby's got to come out to really thrive. So help us even now. Think about those people in our sphere of influence, the closest 10, 12, 15 people in our world. And help us begin to wonder, how can we be the hands and feet of Jesus to them this week? What do you help remind us of what's going on in their lives that we might come alongside them and be your presence for them? change our vision, change our hearts, change our attitudes, that we might really be you with them in their grief, their anger, and their joy, that we might see you come alive in them. And we'll thank you for what you do, and we'll thank you for the joy you bring us when we choose to give it all away. Uh, may beauty abound because we have. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.